is the Bible reliable? Scripture cannot be broken in hearing God in the 21st century. Like I said, I have about seven of them. If anyone would want one, you're welcome to have them. They're, they're up here. Secondly, in the back, the elders have announced we've got these daily Bible reading plans. There's another plan back there if you, you want. This one is a Bible reading plan at your own pace. The other one, uh, I believe, starts with the first of the year and you have things checked off. And Since we're a little bit past the first of the year, you might want to grab this one. Uh, or this one goes chronologically through the Bible, by the way. Uh, what I've done in the past is I've just got me a bookmark and I've started reading where I wanted to go and then when I get to a spot I'd put my bookmark there and put a little mark on the edge of the page so I'd know where I left off and you'll you'll find that if you're reading your Bible every day the lessons that you hear the sermons that you hear will have more meaning to you um, Mike will be up here preaching about one thing and he'll be giving certain verses and, and I'll be sitting back there thinking Oh yeah, that relates to the verse I heard yesterday or, or whatever. And so I've got my own sermon going in my mind while he's making his points up here. Um, sometimes he's up here teaching a class or doing the sermon and I'm thinking, oh wow, he ought to go to such and such a verse. And eventually he gets there, but sometimes he doesn't. And so I've got extra verses that I've thought of in my mind because I've been reading the Bible daily. Uh, actually, I, I don't read the Bible daily. I listen to it. I, it takes me about 35 minutes to drive to work. So I stick the Bible on a CD. It, CD, I'm so 20th, 20th century. I stick the Bible on a CD in my player, and I listen to it on the way to work. So I've got 35 minutes of listening to the Bible on the way to work, and then on the way back, I've got 35 more minutes. So I've got over an hour a day that I listen to the Bible. And, and I find a lot of times that I'll hear a verse that maybe I haven't noticed before, or I'll hear a verse in a way that I haven't noticed it before. In fact, Wednesday night when I gave the uh, little Devo, one of the verses that I used is one that, that I picked up on when I was drive, driving to work, and I heard that and I was like, wow. And I made a note of it, and and when I got to work and looked it up and, and got the uh, passage number and I was able to use that later. When you're uh, talking about the Bible and reading the Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly furnished for all good works. Now, we have to ask ourselves, do we believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Is that God speaking to us? Do we actually believe that? And if we do believe that, why don't we have time to sit down and study our Bible on a regular basis? Oh yeah, that's God's Word, but you know, I don't really have time for it. You know, that doesn't make sense. You know, that's like me saying, I really love my wife, but don't let her talk to me. I'm not going to listen to her. She accuses me of not listening to her anyway. But, uh, but, uh, but if we believe the Bible is God's Word, then we should listen to it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, what does it mean to rightly divide the word of truth? Uh, Alan Webster wrote a tract, I don't know if we have a copy of it or not, that talked about the most misunderstood page in the Bible. Anybody ever read that tract or have any idea what the most misunderstood page in the Bible is? According, He said the most misunderstood page in the Bible, here I'll turn to it real quick.
is this blank page between the Old Testament and the New Testament. You know, there's a lot of verses that are misunderstood in the Bible. And, and people don't handle it correctly. That's what rightly dividing means, to handle correctly the word of truth. If, if the Bible tells us to handle correctly the word of truth, then there must be a way to handle it incorrectly. In fact, there are a lot of ways to handle, handle the scriptures incorrectly. And, and when we do so, we're not going to come up with the ideas that God's trying to convey to us. You know, one of the big ones is people don't understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament in some aspects. Oh, they understand it because you go down the street here and today you'll see various churches and their parking lots will have cars in them. But if you went down the street yesterday on the, what, the seventh day of the week, which would have been the Sabbath, their parking lot would have been empty. So they understand there's a difference between the old law where they worshiped on the Sabbath and the new law where we worship on the first day of the week. But when they do and teach other things, they may not quite understand it. And they may do some things in error because the old law taught it and not realize that we are now under a new law. Uh, when you're looking at uh, various passages in the Bible... There are some things to consider to help you to handle it correctly or rightly divide the word of truth. Some of it's like, who is speaking? You know, you don't want to take a passage where Satan tells someone to do something and think that that's what God told them to do. Uh, Satan told Eve to do something, and it was exactly the opposite of what God had told them to do. You want to look at who is being spoken to. What is the situation surrounding the verse? What is the time period that is, that is, is it the Old Testament, is it the New Testament, is it during a particular event? What, what's going on around that verse? In a command, is it a general command? Or is it a command that's given for other people to obey also Acts 2.39 we look at Acts 2.38 quite often Acts 2.39 goes on and says that this is for you and people who are far off and for your children future generations in other words and so the, the command in verse 38 is for us to obey too not just a one time command but we look in Genesis 6, God's told Noah, go and build an ark out of gopher wood. Well, we're not expected to build, go out and build an ark. I don't even know what gopher wood is. I've, I've read that it's possibly cypress. I heard some people say that it's possibly a specific cut of wood. But that was a one-time command given in a special situation and not something for other people to follow. Uh, and we need to look at a verse and think about is it speaking of something that's literal or something that's figurative? Uh, Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. He was not an actual door. It, it was a figurative, a figure of speech. Uh, we find a lot of figures of speech throughout the Bible, especially in books like Revelation. Uh, but we need to determine that, and that will help us to understand if a verse we're looking at, what it means when we consider all these things. Excuse me. But one other thing we need to look at is the context, and I think that's probably one of the more important ones is to consider the context of a verse. It's easy to take one verse out by itself and to misunderstand it. But when you look at the context, the verses before it and the verses after it, or even the context of how this verse fits into the overall Bible account, then, then it clears it up. Here's a, I've got a couple of examples here. One of them's kind of absurd, you know, would never happen. The other one is, is 
more realistic. My first example of someone taking something out of context, suppose somebody wanted to uh, study their Bible and didn't really have a plan on how to do that, didn't have any understanding on, on where to begin, and so they thought, I'm just going to let the Spirit lead me or I'm going to let fate lead me. And so they flip open their Bible and they decide, I'm going to put down my finger and then read that verse and whatever it says, that must be what God wants me to learn or that must be what God wants me to do. So he flips open his Bible and put, closes his eye and puts down his finger and opens it up and reads it. And he's at John thirteen thirty seven, where Peter said unto him, Lord, why can, I not, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And he thinks, wow. Peter would lay down his life for Christ. That's, that's really noble. Well, let me try that again. He flips to another page and he puts down his finger and ends up at Matthew 27, verse 5. And it says, Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. He's like, ooh. You know, if he didn't realize that was talking about two different people, he, he might think that, Peter promised he would lay down his life for Christ, and then he went and hanged himself. So he says, well, let me see what else I can learn. Closes his eye and puts his finger down. And he comes to Luke 10, 37, and Jesus says, Go thou and do likewise. And the guy's like, oh, I don't know. He's hesitant about that one, you know. Go and do likewise. You know, I just read these verses about killing yourself and... Does God want me to do likewise? So he's you know, not quite as anxious to accept that one as the other one. So he decides, I better give this one more try. Closes his eye, flips the page, puts his finger down, and comes to a verse, which is John thirteen twenty seven, where Jesus says, What you're about to do, do quickly. Obviously, this man did not properly understand the Bible. He did not ha handle correctly the word of truth. All of these verses are direct quotes out of the Bible. But that's not the way we ought to study. We shouldn't just take verses here or verses there. We should consider them more, more closely. My other example is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. Satan said to Jesus, It is written. And then Satan quotes Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. Satan accurately quoted scriptures. He said, It is written. Then Jesus said in the very next verse, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. There we see that Satan took a verse but neglected the context of the entire Bible. And so Jesus corrected it by looking at the context. You know, some people say that you can interpret the Bible and get it to say anything you want it to say. You know, I've heard that. I'm sure some of you have heard that. I saw some heads nodding. You know, you can't interpret the Bible and get it to say anything you want. You cannot do it. Now, what you can do is you can misinterpret the Bible and get it to say anything you want. And a lot of people do misinterpret the Bible. John 17:17, 17, 17, Jesus said, Your word is truth. And so, it, it's true whether we understand it or not. It's true whether we accept it or not. God's Word is truth. It's a standard that we should live by. First Thessalonians 2.13 says, When you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. God's Word is truth, and we should, we should treat it as such. We can, uh, we can understand the Bible. You know, a lot of people will deny that. They'll say, you, you, I just can't understand the Bible. Well, part of it's the handling correctly, the word of truth. If you're handling it correctly, it makes it more understandable. Uh, one thing we need to 
know is that the Bible does not contradict itself. And so if you have two verses that seem to contradict each other, then more study is needed. There's a misunderstanding somewhere. You either misunderstand one verse, or maybe you misunderstand both of the verses. But you need to study it more closely and see what the Bible actually says. You know, two people can't... I tell you, two people or two churches can't teach things that contradict each other and both of them be right. Two things cannot contradict and both be right at the same time. One of them, or maybe both of them, must be an error because they're contradicting the Scriptures. Since the Scriptures don't contradict themselves, if if I say something is true and, and someone else says the opposite is true and, what I, and they say what I say is false, then there's a contradiction. We can't both be right. One of us has to be right. Well, no. One of us may be right and the other one has to be wrong because two things can't contradict each other and both be true at the same time. I don't know if you've ever seen the bumper sticker Tell them we said hi. (laughs) I don't know if you've seen the bumper sticker that says coexist. And it has has symbols from various religions across it to to make out the letters in the word coexist. Well, you know, that can't can't really happen. There's another organization that has a similar bumper sticker that has various symbols like that across that spells word, but they're word they spell is contradict and then in smaller letters it, it below it says they can't all be true well that's the way it is if if we're teaching things that contradict each other then we both can't be true we need to study and see exactly what is true first corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 paul t- told the corinthians I beseech you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ, I beseech you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, when Paul says that they should all speak the same thing. How many is all? How many divisions are in no divisions? You know, if they're going to be of the same mind and of the same judgment, they need to have the same authority to go by. And that authority has got to be the Bible. Ephesians 3 verse 4, Paul said... When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. People say we can't understand the Bible. But Paul said, when you read, you may understand. We can understand. Ephesians 5, 7, Paul says, Therefore, be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13 says, for we are not writing any other things to you other than that what you have what you read or understand. Boy, I messed up reading that, didn't I? <laughs> for we are not writing any other things to you uh, than what you have. For some reason, I can't get that one out. <laughs> I'm not rightly handling this verse here. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. I trust you will understand even to the end. There. I finally got it. Paul wanted us to understand what he had written. You know, if we can't understand the Scriptures, then that only leaves a couple of uh, options. You know, if we believe it's God's Word, 
You know, if we don't understand it, it you know, we may not believe it's God's word. That's one option. But if we believe it's God's word, which I think everyone in here does, believes that the Bible is God's word. If we believe it's God's word, then God and we can't understand it, then then God was either unwilling for us to understand it or unable to write it in such a way that we could understand it. Now, if he's unwilling for us to understand it, he's not a just God. Because the Bible says that we will be judged by the words that are in this book. Who was going to call God an unjust God? Now, if he's not able for us to understand, or give it in a way where we can understand it, that uh, strikes against the ability of God. God knows us better than we know ourselves. One verse in the Bible says that he even knows the number of hairs on our heads. Now, for some of us, that's a little bit easier than for others. <laughs> Isn't that right, Tyrone? <laughs> But for some of y'all know the number of hairs on your head, that's quite a number. He knows us better than we even know ourselves. And so he would be able to give us his word in a way that we could understand it. And in fact, the Bible says that we must understand his word. There are commands that are given that we must follow. You know, are we going to stand before the judgment says, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't quite understand that command. What was the reason for that? You know, I don't see any reason why a person has to be baptized, perhaps, someone might say. You know, I, I just don't understand how that fits into your plan. Now, God gave us a command. He expects us to understand it. He expects us to obey it. We need to consider the context of the verses. For example... Someone might look at uh, Acts chapter two, verse twenty-one. If y'all want to camp out in the Acts two, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a bit of time there here in a little bit. That verse says, "Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved." Now, if you take that verse, just separate it from the rest of the chapter. And someone teaches you that that you know you're saved by saying the sinner's prayer, then that verse may seem to indicate that that's true. If you just isolate that verse, you know, if someone says you know you're saved by faith only, you know, that that verse might seem to make some sense. But we can't take it out of context. I've got a verse here listed in my notes and I don't have... Oh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus said, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father that is in heaven. That verse would seem to contradict the idea of the sinner's prayer because it's the one that does God's will that will enter in heaven. So which one's true? You know, sometimes we have a question like that. Well, what must I do to be saved? And we play a game that I call... Actually, I didn't come up with this name. Someone accused me of playing this game. Bible pinball. Have y'all ever played pinball? Most of us have. Uh, I, there's, there's not too many in here that are so young they hadn't at one time or another played a pinball game. Pull back that thing and the ball goes up and it hits the bumpers. And what does it do? It bounces all over the place. That's, that's some... Sometimes when we're trying to teach someone or t sometimes when we're trying to learn what God wants us to do, that's what we tend to do. 
We, we go and look. Well, you know, this scripture over Matthew says, that one over in Luke says, here's one in Galatians that says, and just all over. And we never really consider the context of any of those verses. We just hit several verses quickly. For example, the plan of salvation. We all know the plan of salvation. I don't believe there's anyone in here that does not know it. We were raised to some of five steps to the plan of salvation, some six, you know. Uh, and, and you can see this printed on various things, house to house, heart to heart. I've seen it on little pocket calendars with the plan of salvation on the back. And it'll say, and, and I got these verses off of one of those things. The, the one, you've seen the one with the steps. It has the steps going up and on each step it has a different verse. Plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithfully. Those are, those are true steps. If you want to be saved, that's what you need to do. But what it'll say is here, Romans ten seventeen. Believe, John eight twenty four. Repent, Luke thirteen three. Confess, Matthew ten thirty two. Be baptized, Acts two thirty eight, and live faithfully, Revelation two ten. See how it bounces from one place to another. And never really considers the context of any of those verses. All of those are good verses. All of them teach what what this plan says, but it never really considers the context. The Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31 said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your household. I used to have a boss that had a Bible in, in her office. She was a member of a denomination and, and apparently this Bible, this study Bible, was published by by her denomination. Anyway, it had that verse. It had Acts 16, 30 and 31, and then it stopped. And in the middle of the text, it, it had a quite sizable space. It placed a space in the text. And in that space, it had a footnote. Right there in the col same column with the verses, it had a footnote where it says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The footnote said something like, This is all that is required for salvation. They, they didn't consider the rest of the context. They stopped too quickly. They stopped before the story was finished. Because the next two verses said, they spoke to him the word of the Lord and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and immediately, immediately he and his family were baptized. You see, if you take the whole context, you see, he says, what must I do to be saved? He was told to believe. They spoke the word of the Lord to him, so he heard, hear, believe. He was washing their stripes. He was probably the one that gave them them stripes to begin with. So he had changed the direction he was going. So that implies repentance. And that in the same hour of the night, which verse 25 says was about midnight, he was baptized. The only thing you don't have listed here is, is really confession. But obviously they knew that he believed, so he obviously had to have told them somehow that he believed. So here you've got hear, believe, repent, confess, and he was baptized when you consider the context. And don't stop before the story is done. Well, in Acts 2, you know, I read earlier that verse in Acts 2, 21, "...whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved." Well, let's look at the context. Does that say that all we need to do is say a sinner's prayer? Well, let's, let's see if it says that or if it says hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithfully. First here, in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, 
Peter said, Heed my words. Verse 22, he said, Hear these words. Verse 29, he said, Let me speak freely. Verse 37, Now when they heard this, yeah, they had to hear. They had to hear the word of God. Believe. Did they have to believe? Verse 37 says, they were cut to the heart. You know, Romans 10.10 says, with the heart one believes. So something pricked their heart. So that would indicate belief. Verse 41 says, those who gladly received the word. Well, if you've received the word, you believe it. You, you don't receive a word that you don't believe. Verse 44, now all who believed were together. Here, they believed. Repent. That one's easy. Did they, did they need to repent? Acts 2.38, Peter said unto them, repent. So yes, they heard, they believed, they repented. Did they confess? There's not a confession per se in, in, in this verse, but verse 37, when they cried out, what shall we do? That was a verbal expression that made it clear that they believed what Peter had taught them. So it, confession is implied. Romans 10.10, 10, with the mouth, confession is made. They made a verbal, verbal statement that made it clear that they believed. Were they baptized? Peter told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins. Notice I used the word unto instead of for. A lot of the Bible translations say for. American Standard Version says unto. The New International Version of the Bible when it came out in 1973, in this verse said, be baptized so that your sins may be forgiven. I used to say that, you know, some people say you're baptized because your sins have already been forgiven. I used to say that uh, it's interesting, I'd look through 27, 28, 30 different English translations and never found one that said that. You know, it's odd that if that's what it meant that no, none of these translations got it right. I can't say that anymore because there's a new, newer translation that has come out that says be baptized because your sins have been forgiven. But other than that newer one, all of them say something either for the forgiveness of sins, for the remission of sins, so that your sins may be forgiven in order to, for your sins to be forgiven or things like that. And that's the accurate translation of that verse. But yes, they were told to be baptized. Verse 41, those that gladly received his word were baptized. And that day there was added to them about 3,000 souls. They were baptized that day. Now, think about that. There's 3,000 people going to be baptized that day. That would take quite a bit of doing. You, th you think if, if just a few people were doing the bapti baptizing, that it would take, you know, you'd have to baptize a lot of people. I assume that, that the apostles baptized some, and then as they baptized some, they baptized others. Uh, we're not told, but, but still. Got a hundred people baptizing people. Each person would have to baptize 30 people. You know, that, that's a lot of... Your arm's going to be so, sore by the end of the day, probably. Uh, that shows to me the importance of baptism. Uh, but yeah, they, they were told to be baptized, and they were baptized. So they heard, they believed, they repented, they confessed, and they were baptized. And then verse 42 through 47 tells us they continued steadfastly. They remained faithful. They had the type of unity that we, we should have.
you know, uh, the same statement, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, that's in Romans chapter 10, verse 13 also. You can do the same thing with Romans 10 that, that I've just done with Acts 2. You know, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord does not mean just saying a prayer. It means to follow these steps of salvation. You've got to do them all. Uh, in Romans ten, thirteen, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, you can do the same thing by looking at the context. You may have to expand the context a little bit wider in Romans to to get the full plan of salvation. But it's there. Uh, especially look at, at chapters three through six, as well as chapter ten. Uh, you know, they, they were... Actually, Romans chapter 1 talks about their faith is spoken of in the whole world, so they had faith. Um, it, verses talk about they, they, they heard, they, they believed, they confessed. Romans 6 is a classic chapter on, on, on baptism, and they were encouraged to live faithfully. So yeah, the whole plan of salvation is there in Romans chapter... Romans in the book of Romans is like in the back book of Acts. You know, sometimes I'm glad our Bible's divided in book, chapter, and verse because it helps you to find verses. You know, I can say Acts chapter 2 and y'all know where I'm talking about. You could open your Bible and find Acts chapter 2 if you wanted to. Uh, you know, if it wasn't divided like that, uh, I, I would have to say, okay, you know in Acts where they're talking about the day of Pentecost, the early part of Acts, and, and you'd have to go through the pages till you found where I was. And it'd be hard for me to say one, one verse by verse number. You'd just have to figure out where I was. So, so I'm glad that we have that. But sometimes that causes us to look at one verse and not consider the verses around it, or one chapter, and not the chapters around it. Uh, this is displayed for me very clearly in Acts chapter 21. How sometimes the the books or or the chapter, where the chapters in the books or the uh, verses are are cut off in very odd places. Acts chapter 21 ends with verse 40. So when he had given, per, given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, that's the end of the chapter. He spoke to them saying, well, what did he say? <laughs> You don't know if you just stop with that chapter. You have to go on to chapter 22 to see what Paul said. And so, when you read your Bible, especially the New Testament, especially the epistles, try to read it from beginning to the end like it was written. You know, you wouldn't pick up a letter that you got from someone and, uh, you know, you got a letter from a relative. Oh, what'd she say? Oh, well, let's, here she says this, and you wouldn't skip around like that. You would read it from beginning to end to get the understanding of what they were trying to communicate to you. I'm about out of time, but I am out of time. <laughs> Let me make one more point. When I was going through the Bible, one of the first times I read the book of uh, Colossians, I was struck by two verses that I knew very well. One is Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. One of the primary verses we go to if we're talking about the subject of music in the church, and rightly so. There's only about nine verses that talk about music in the church. But we go to that verse... And I did not realize the very next verse was Colossians 3.17. 
You know, I knew Colossians 3.17. I just never put it together in my mind that that was the next verse. And whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of, according to the authority of, according to the direction of the Lord Jesus. You know, we talk about why we don't have an organ or a piano up here, and we start talking about, well, the Bible authorizes us. How many, how many syllables are in authorizes? <laughs> the Bible authorizes that we sing Colossians 3.16. To me, Colossians 3.17 has even more power to that because it tells us to whatever we're doing, do according to the authority or instructions of the Lord. And so we need to do that in the music in the church. I appreciate y'all's understanding. I know I didn't stop long enough for anybody to say anything, but uh, I hope this was beneficial to you. Yeah.